Hi there, I'm Duncan Weatherston. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Smile CDR. Um, my background is as a technologist and an architect, uh, both in healthcare and other realms of, of activity. Um, for the past 20 years, I've been an architect in healthcare, working with the realization implementation of electronic health records. Today's presentation is about um, a new idea that we have around how fire is going to change the way that we interoperate and interact in healthcare. And I think it's a big change. So it's called APIs and the Internet of Health. Um, so we're going to try and cover in this session uh, sort of a brief perspective of the history of the Internet. And it's very short, just a couple of slides sort of talking about why the Internet was successful. And then we'll kind of talk about that in the context of what I'm calling the Internet of Health, which is the ability for fire to transform the way we interoperate. Um, and then beyond that, we're going to sort of talk about uh, how fire is used and can be deployed in ways that are <clears throat> transformative, not just for healthcare, but for the participants and the, the sort of use of information in general. Um, as, as a delivery tool. And then we'll, we'll sort of go through some case studies and wrap up. As far as I know, we don't have a huge number of participants today. So at any point in time, if you have questions or you want to stop me, feel free to type in a question and um, I will take some time out to sort of talk about it. We have a fairly large number of slides, so I'm not going to talk to all of them, but I will try and cover all the topics associated with them. We have about an hour for this conversation. So the first thing I want to talk about, the reason why I call it the Internet of Health, I don't want to belabor um, the analogy too much, I'll talk about that in a bit, uh, is the fact that the history of the Internet was one that started from something very similar to where we are right now in healthcare. You know, there was a bunch of information in silos and the, the activity associated with it was largely in terms of pushing data from place to place if you're able to get data to move at all. And, you know, when we think about that, that characterization um, describes very well the way that information works in healthcare today. So, so I think the, the reason I choose this sort of analogy of fire will bring about the internet of healthcare is driven by the fact that fire is starting to provide value in the same space that the internet did in the early days. And so in the early days, you know, um, I remember one conversation I had in like the early 90s, maybe the late 80s, probably the early 90s, um, where, where somebody was talking about the fact that we could sort of connect all these computers together and potentially share information. And the response I got back was, well, why would I want to do that? You know, I've got all the information I need in my office. I don't need to share anything with anybody. And obviously, you know, um, it came a long way from there. I mean, the, the, the net effect was that thereafter, it became clear that we were going to connect everything and connect everybody. And what were the benefits? Well, although the people couldn't see it at the time, it was pretty much their lives changed, right? And at the end of that process, nobody could possibly imagine an environment in which they weren't connected to the internet, where we didn't have the ability to communicate between systems and we didn't, you know, have, for example, the web and, and all the other stuff that we've sort of taken for granted in, in the modern era. One of the things that I'm going to provide some parallel with is this idea of the request for comments. They, they were the mechanism by which the internet standards were shared. And while TCP IP itself was a sort of protocol that enabled data sharing across networks, it, it replaced what were essentially a set of proprietary networks before that. There were vendors like Novell who had something called IPX or Banyan that had a protocol called Banyan Vines or digital systems that had something called DECnet and LAT. There are all these different ways of communicating owned by different proprietary sort of vendors. And ultimately what happened was there was this realization that we could communicate far more effectively if we had a single set of standards and we had a single approach to it. And what went out was the set of standards produced by DARPA called you know, the internet standards. And at the foremost of that was something called TCP IP, which was a network session, a network, sorry, a network protocol that enabled session management and, and sort of controlled communications. And it was on the back of this really open standard that the whole internet got built. And I think this idea of open standards and well-published content and the idea of breaking down silos and the idea of having a good mechanism to discuss the, the, for the public to participate in the standards generation process was what made it very successful. That and the fact that there were lots of participants who could then build things on their own and there was an appetite for sharing information. I think if we start to look at healthcare, we'll see that all of these things are there. I'll talk about that in a second. So 
What ended up happening was on the back of that really open standard TCP IP was we built a whole bunch of new capabilities, right? And so we had browsers and HTTP and web servers all come together. But you know, before that, we had things like Gopher and FTP and, and the real sort of killer app of the time was just email, right? You know, before the ability to receive email was sort of a endemic in the environment. The way it worked was through these silos that would push a batch of files from one to the other, and eventually a message would make its way across a set of bulletin boards and get to you if you were geeky enough to participate at all. And again, I'm going to show how this kind of a corollary to that in today's today's sort of healthcare space as well is the idea that you know we, we tend to push data around the place as opposed to um, have a transactional relationship. And we don't have this idea of ubiquitous sharing because we've got silos and, and isolated standards. And really, you know, when we get to the world of fire, all of that is going to change, right? And so this is why I call it the Internet of Health. And and I think the goal in my head when I talk, describe it this way is to say, you know, there's an opportunity for us to knock down the walls that hold the silos uh, apart. And there's a common standard that's available now for exchanging information. And, it, you know, it's not the same as the Internet. You know, we're not talking about the days when people had very low speed modems and what have you. But it is the same spirit and is the same kind of concept. And I don't want to try and do a one-to-one -one analysis, but I do want to do a conceptual analysis. And so if you think about the participants in the Internet of Health, there, there's there's a few of them, right? There's healthcare providers, and, and that could be, you know, pretty much anybody from a doctor through a health system. Um, there's patients who, you know, obviously are the recipients of healthcare. And, and it's important to remember that despite the fact that we are providers, we're all patients. Everybody has some footprint in in this environment. And I think that's one of the characteristics that make it similar to the Internet of the internet in the first place is that you know the internet was available to all and everybody's a patient so there really is a good parallel there um, there are payers of course who you know fund the systems researchers who participate there's public health and there's a lot more there's allied healthcare professionals and, and a sort of broader market I, but i think the critical point is that there is a large community of participants each of whom have an interest in being able to share information and participate in in communications with each other and to that end i think Today, we don't have that. Today, what we have is a set of um, isolated groups who get some functionality. So if you're a patient, you might have your devices on your watch. You might be able to use like really great innovations like Apple Health to be able to reach out to an environment and get data onto your phone. You might be able to um, you know, even you know, do remote health with your provider, but there's no consistent experience there. And if you're a healthcare provider, for sure, you're not getting data that you need all the time from all the places that you want. And you're, when you do get data, you have the challenge of consuming it and interacting with it. There, there's a big sort of um, steep hill for providers to interact with information properly. Payers have traditionally been viewed as participants in the ecosystem who are associated with funding and not necessarily with care. And those walls need to break down. Researchers sort of try and get information where they can. And public health sort of, you know, interacts where it can where, where it can get access to information but certainly is lacking um, any sort of consistent um, interoperability with the rest of the system that will serve them in ways that they want to be served so you know we're back where we were in bulletin board days in the internet and so i think that for me is why i talk about the internet of health is because we have to go from there um, into a place where you're able to move forward, right? And if, if I, when I say the internet of health, what I mean is, and we'll talk about how we'll get there, but what I mean is this idea that as a um, participant, you can reasonably connect and expect that services that you understand well will be available for you in ways that are meaningful um, to your specialty, right? So as a clinician, you'll be able to get to information about your patients easily. You won't be trying to figure out what your EMR has and what's not in the EMR. And when you arrive at a hospital, the notion of med rec will be solved. And, and, and that whole variety of interaction um, will be continuous and just like it is with the web, right? Today, when, when you log in to find something, you expect Google to be available in your search to work, no problem. You expect that your phone will work seamlessly with all of the other applications out there. It's, it's that experience of sort of continuity um, that people have come to expect in commercial realms, you know, their banking works this way, that we need to expect in healthcare, right? And the reason why we don't have it in healthcare is not because healthcare has had a hard time adopting internet technologies, network standards, consistency. It's because we haven't managed to get to a place of semantic interoperability. We haven't been able to get past our roots, and we certainly haven't been able to go beyond the idea of data silos that then exchange information from side to side. And when I say exchange information from side to side, we have standards 
that have brought about interoperability. You know, we have HL7 version two, which allows you to push a bunch of information from one computer to another computer and then take advantage of it. We have the ability to package up information and share it through, you know, CCD and, and, and CDA and whatever it happens to be. We have a variety of capabilities that solve portions of the need, but we don't have a consistent and common approach. And, and the reason is kind of manifold. I think the, the we'll get to that in a little bit, but I think what we haven't had is a good way for everybody to participate evenly at the same time against the same systems. And I think one of the things that's really important to recognize about FIRE is that we have now a mechanism where everybody can participate as a peer. If you look at the way FIRE has approached standardization, they have a maturity model that allows for use and voting and participation through that channel. They have a mechanism to propose changes to the standard that's relatively open. Their whole flow is driven by an internet-based um, access pathway that is available for free through a common link. The, the processes that are chosen have been specifically aligned with the way we do things in 2021. We have RESTful web services, we use JSON, we're sort of structured in a way that is really well aligned with what's going on in the regular internet, but it's for healthcare. And so there is this merging of technology standards, which is usable by developers and participants. But more importantly, there's a pattern and practice of accessibility and availability that was what was so successful that was so successful with the internet. And I think when we get to the root of that conversation, what we'll talk about is the way that um, something called implementation guides influence all of this. And I'm going to be very detailed, not very detailed, I'll try and be as detailed as I can be for, for this level of conversation about the value of implementation guides in coming slides. So an implementation guide describes how to use the FHIR standard to deliver outcomes. And so what that means is, um, and we'll, we'll go to it later, I'm going to pick specifically on something like um, prior authorization as, as, a, as a really clear example of how an implementation guide can deliver value. Because the burden reduction group have done a great job of engaging with developers, engaging with the, with the community, and they've got this really great implementation guide set that describes what you ought to do to be able to share information that's going to provide meaningful value both for payers and providers. So I, I, like, I like this use case as an example. But, let me go back a bit to talk about RFCs and the internet. So in the early days of the internet, like way back to the late 60s, there was this concept of request for comments amongst a small group of participants in a networking space that allowed them to talk about how they might use their technologies to have outcomes that they want. And you know, by the, by the early 80s, um, those requests for comments contained descriptions of things like networking standards like TCPIP and um, information communication standards that end up driving mail like SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, or um, things like File Transfer Protocol or Telnet, which was used for remote access. So the RFCs weren't used for a particular, well, you know, join TCPIP and your, your, your solution will come. One of the things that was really cool about the internet was it was a collection of standards that all sort of understood each other and all worked together. And FHIR is providing that mechanism through implementation guides. These implementation guides are ways that people can communicate ideas about how to use FHIR to solve problems, right? How to use FHIR to resolve a really thorny issue like, for example, uh, prior authorization. How do, I, how do I set it up so people can discover what documents are required, discover how to exchange information, how to render a decision, how to understand that decision, all packaged together in a description that uses the FHIR standard as the underlying mechanism, but extends far beyond the FHIR standard to use other protocols that are meaningful and useful, like um, clinical quality language, CQL, or like, um, uh, sorry, CDS hooks, which allows you to launch views from, from other systems. There, there's, there is a wealth of participation. And this is the last piece of what I think that um, FHIR defines the Internet of Health. The FHIR community is like the Internet community. Community is a core part of everything with FHIR. Competitors get together to talk about how we can solve problems. And all of us, and I will talk about this at the end, view the status quo as the thing we're trying to overwhelm. Because the status quo doesn't allow for the easy transmission of information across participants. It doesn't allow for the use of information in place. And most importantly, it doesn't treat information as the lifeblood of the next generation of healthcare delivery and I think we in the fire community believe this very strongly and and as a collection we're going to surmount these and RFCs 
um, and IGs share that same role of disseminating that information amongst the community and then making it available to everybody else for participation. So if you want to know how to use something, you can find it as an implementer. So I don't want to abuse the analogy, right? Um, obviously, the internet is not healthcare and, and fire is not TCPIP and what we're doing is not le legitimately identical because the community that we're addressing isn't the entirety of the population of mankind initially out of the gate for people who want to look at um, you know pictures of stuff or who want to buy new telephones. This really is focused on the clinical community and the analogy and, and, and the alignment only extends so far. But it's a very, very useful metaphor, right? The reason it's a useful metaphor is because it brings together the notion of shared structures, implementation guides, processes for rolling things out, and it lets you have a methodology for participating yourself. And it gives you as a, as, as a member of the community an opportunity to see yourself in, in, the, in, the, in the role and then be able to build your own solutions in ways that are aligned with this approach. And as you join the participants, you will see the benefits of participation and you'll be more inclined to participate further. And it's, it's that process, which I think happened with the internet. You know, I'll, I'll pick one last discussion of my early days of the internet. At the time, I thought the internet was really amazing. It was 1994. And I went and talked to a marketing company that had a relationship with a large automobile manufacturer. And I went to talk to them and I said, you know, there's this really great opportunity called the internet where you could present your cars and you could provide brochures for people to see how to fix things. And you'd have this opportunity to really reach out to people through an open standard where you can sort of share data in ways that previously have not been available. And they totally didn't get it. They said, we don't see this and it's not gonna go. And they went with a completely proprietary private networking strategy that never really panned out and shut down by the mid to late nineties, right? And so the view is that the prevailing implementation is better. And that was the way it was then. It's where we're fighting against now. And I think this is really the last piece of um, the fire versus internet analogy I wanna drag to, to the forefront, which is, you know, the internet was viewed by many people as a fad when we first started talking about it. Clearly it wasn't a fad. Fire has to overcome a history of people saying, oh yeah, so this is the next new standard. Sure, pull, you know, tell me again how this is gonna change my life. And we really do have to fight that uphill battle because there's been so many that have gone before us that people say, heard it before, don't believe it now. But realistically and in implementation, fire is that standard that's going to change it because it provides so many capabilities and it's so well aligned with what we're doing today in other realms of online health. And the time is now, right? Governments are getting behind it. International organizations are getting behind it. And everybody is seeing the benefit of surmounting what has been, what I said before, a siloed environment so that we can have a truly interoperable world and start building on a future on top of that. And that for me is really the important part of the, the analogy here is once you can get past the challenges of how do I connect these things together, you can start really solving the picture of what am I going to do now that I'm there? And that's where the magic's going to come from, right? You know, I, you can talk about all the kinds of things that ought to happen, but you can imagine a day in the future where we have some equivalent to Snapchat, where, you know, an idea that was not even possibly considered in 1994 is in the hands of young people who are using it to, you know, delete the, the, the remnants of their silly conversation so that it's not left lying around the internet and they're able to have streaks with each other and everything else. These notions that, that as my childhood would have seen science fiction-y are now reality. And if you think about where we can get once we get past the basis of, of, of the communication challenges we're experiencing today in healthcare, it's that type of change we're going to see come. And that's really what I believe in when I say we all ought to pursue the internet of health and why, you know, the analogy is important. So I agree. So um, I'm going to talk to that question from, from Jennifer. Um, so the challenge with malware is that it's able to overtake a particular system and shut down interactions in that system. And, and really, if you think about you know, ransomware and the other bits and pieces um, that have, have caused problems, they're, they're focused on some way to surmount an individual system. 
Part of what we're trying to implement with the Internet of Health is this notion that information can reside in many places. And so the, the consequence of a particular isolated incident of malware or ransomware doesn't actually impede your ability to participate, it impedes that particular node's ability to support value and deliver value. Um, I think it's a critical, I'm going to talk about security and the importance of security in, in, in the grander scheme of things, but the, the goal here is that you should be able to participate in a, in a, in a distributed system where each of the nodes is able to drive value and bring value, and then you have to watch out for security in your systems and maintain that security in much the same way as we do today. You know, the internet doesn't shut down because individual systems um, have challenges. The, the broader flow is able to continue, and then we're able to improve and, and find ways to shut down the, the specific attacks. You know, you bring up a really important point, but I think the, the key the key model we have to follow is, like I said, that, that I mean, again, not to overstretch the analogy, um, but is that internet pathway where, where it is distributed and we do have the ability to, to um, heal from, from, from blockages and, and, and sort of loss of routing. I don't want to try to stay away too much from the analogy. From, from, function, from functional shutdowns, the goal is to be distributed enough that we can heal from it. So with that in mind, I, I've got some trends to watch. And these, these are just like illustrations of, of things that are happening today that sort of can whet your appetite for where things could go tomorrow. Um, and so the first one is data services, right? And I, I kind of alluded to this earlier on, is this idea that the way it is right now is this traditional interoperability idea where health system one pushes data through a batch or a stream to health system two, which then has to ingest it, understand it, process it, and then try and figure out what, what use it can make of it. And you've got a real challenge in that space with if you push too much data, it's very hard to process and, and discern and use. Ah, yes, I'll get to that in a second. Thanks, Jennifer. That's a, that's a good good point. I'll come back to that momentarily. Um, so you've got this this notion of pushing your data to others, and you have to rely on them to be able to to um, to fight with it, you know, in terms in terms of you, to making use of that information. But in, in the new world, the way that you would do that is rather than just push all of your data to a far side, you would expose an API, a, a mechanism by which participating systems can talk to you. And we have a, we have a precedent for that today. You know, lots of people have web servers where they provide access to information, or they have, uh, you know, DNS servers where you can resolve how do I look up somebody's name. Right when you go to Microsoft.com, what happens is the domain name system provides a mechanism to find Microsoft.com, and your computer goes and talks to it. You know. Um, when you look for all of the, the records you're interested in in the world, you go to Google and you send a request to Google, which then comes back with a list. You don't get Google to push you all of the websites they know and then you have to look through it. So the way that the, the internet works is this notion of um, exposing services to consumers and then the consumers can use those services in ways that are meaningful. And when you think about what that means for healthcare, presumably as an organization, you can figure out, and this, I'm gonna tie this into your question, Jennifer, um, you can tie this into what information you're willing to expose and what are you willing to risk. So when you put it on the internet, what you're really saying is, I'm willing to make this information available to partners in a mechanism where if they're properly authenticated and authorized, they can come and access for it. And I will have an accountability framework where I can verify that their system is entitled to make the request they're making and that the scope of the request, the request they're making is managed. And there are ways that we do that today with FHIR. There's something called Smart on FHIR in which specific scopes are predefined and in which we actually only constrain the information that we're going to expose to what the consumer is allowed to see. And so the way that we would solve this problem is, although you can go on the grid um, and take a risk, what you're really risking is that as long as your security model is good enough, that the individuals connecting to you can only expose themselves to risk in the scope that they're entitled to have access to to begin with. And the way that we manage that is going to get better and better as time goes by. But ultimately, you can envision a world in which, um, much akin to the DNS problem I mentioned earlier on, how do I find Microsoft? and the Google exposure of information, how do I find Joe, where you as an authorized clinician can have a patient who comes in and you can say, I would like to find the medical records for uh, Janet Smith who's in front of me and your system will understand how to make a request in a way that takes advantage of your right as a clinician against a network that's established for your purview 
um, to request information about Janet Smith that has been intentionally shared with that system. And then you'll talk to each of the components and well, you won't, your system will talk to each of the components, provide you with an aggregate view and present it to you in a way that's meaningful. And then within the context of your um, obligation, both from a, um, a data records perspective and from a compliance perspective, your system will keep what's necessary, but it won't have to rely on being the permanent system of record for each of those components. It'll be the system of record for your transactions and your decisions. And so you can imagine that that could get bigger and even richer, but you know, even today being able to, as a clinician type in, I'd like to know about um, Janet, now that she's here in front of me, uh, is a stretch, right? You know, you can know what, what your hospital system knows about or what your primary care practice has got access to, but there's no broad system baked in that will find a mechanism to get you that data in real format. And we've got good starts on this. We've got Commonwealth and others who are approaching it, but um, I think the real, the real path to the future, the whole goal of our internet flavored interoperability is to break down those needs for single clustered environments and provide a capability for broader finding and broader interaction. And and obviously, you know, there are challenges to surmount. The internet had the same problems. We had security issues right from the start. We've got a big running start on that idea today. We've got already um, defense mechanisms. And I, I would argue that, you know, in terms of malware, a well-managed um, Fire service and a fire uh, collection at your at your particular point of access is a very good defense against a malware process because it won't be accessed directly by uh, all the desktops in your environment. It does have that abstraction where you've got protection by um, specialized network security and it's being managed and maintained by experts in your environment. In fact, as we go along, it's even getting better. A lot of these services are being hosted by third parties who are focused specifically on security and, and realization. What we're seeing today, just the last point on, on that security discussion, well, the last point until I get to the security section, what we're seeing today is that um, a lot of hospitals and a lot of organizations are looking for um, insured and well-managed support of hosted systems specifically to to reduce the risk or um, share the risk of inappropriate software accessing environments. So, so that's kind of the core idea of data services. I can, you know, there's there's a lot more to talk about, and when we get to the to the discussion specifically about pro, about um, about implementation guides, I'll d dive a bit more into the use of APIs. But you can get the idea here, right? That that there is this collaboration idea that is coming, that this idea that the participants will be able to decide what they're willing to risk, what they're willing to share, how they're willing to expose it, and, and where they're willing to where they're willing to take advantage of these environments. And what we've seen with our clients is that after they get a taste, they really get an appetite. You know, they, they, they start to do very innovative things and you know go well beyond what we imagined when we first talked to them. Workflow. So this is an area I love because this is an example of um, aligned technologies coming together in the way I was talking about before, right? And the internet was not just TCP IP, not just one owner of standards. The internet was a collection of participants coming together to do really cool things. And the um, the, the object management group um, have who have done a fantastic job with BPM. And they've got this other group, BPM Plus Health, that's looking at how do we how do we build workflow in conjunction with data stores, in conjunction with business need, in ways that are meaningful for participants to have outcomes that are of value. Um, and it's going to drive some really great solutions, right? Like if you think about the way that things have happened in the past, again, back to this idea of I push some data at you and you figure out how to fit it into your stream and then you do stuff with it. And if you're lucky, you've got some technology like, um, a, a, a workflow management component um, that's able to receive something and then add some workflow steps for you um, and then you know take it to the next level the, the, that, that sort of a hodgepodge of technologies was was cobbled together specifically to sign, try and solve some some problems that have um, ongoing need in the environment right so if you think I'll give you an example let's follow the let's follow the process for something like um, well, let's let's use one that we're going to talk about later. Let's follow the process for prior authorization. So the first thing that has to happen is you have to go and figure out what um, services are available to your patient um, from their insurer. Then 
you have to request the forms that are applicable to that. And you also need to know what conditions would result in uh, positive approval. And you have to be able to fill out the forms and confirm that you've provided enough information. Each of those steps you can imagine goes, you go to the insurer, the insurer may or may not want to have a human being interact with it, send something back to you where you need to interact with it, or it goes back to an insurer or a payer where they have to interact with it. Each of those requires some potential augmentation, some human workflow, some process workflow. And, and all of these things, um, you know, need to come together in a seamless way. And then in other environments, we've done that, right? If, if you think about the way that um, it works at your bank, when, when you use a request to create an account, they have all those workflows in the back working for you today. But that's because they were able to build that out over the past 25 years of, of, of sort of vision of internet access. Healthcare is now getting there. We have these combined these combined talents. And I feel like there, there's a huge opportunity for us going forward in the future to take these visions that are aligned and driving towards the same outcomes and merge them into, into common offerings that solve problems for clinicians, solve problems for researchers. There, you can imagine a researcher, I'll, I'll give you a really great flow for research here. Um, as a researcher, you want to gain access to a set of data that's pertinent for you, but it may exist across a number of systems where you've made a request to, let's say, all the hospitals in your region for, for access for information, where they're going to then evaluate, are you as a researcher part of their credentialed network that they're willing to share with? And they can make a decision, yes and no, and it'll come back to you that you know, you'd provide this level of assurance. Perhaps there's some ethical consideration in this discussion that they want to have assurance you're participating appropriately or wherever it happens to be. And then you've got an opportunity to feed back, and you can imagine Imagine that then it goes to somebody in their environment who's going to go through um, an internal process to distill some information that they're willing to share and then republish that and then you'll get notification and it goes on and on all these cases where workflow is going to be valuable there's this alignment and this flow of systems that is coming and you can imagine a future where this is getting handled seamlessly again for you where you don't have to as a participant know about all of the work that's going on in the background you just have to be able to um, take advantage of it, right? There, there's no longer a need for somebody to tell you, well, I'm going to go and figure out how to configure an enterprise service bus for you to blah, blah, blah. This whole thing is coming together as a confluence of capabilities shared through this idea of implementation guides that describe how to use these discrete technologies in ways that are meaningful to an outcome. I think it's really, really powerful. And we're going to, uh, it's like, we're going to see this unleashed because the imagination of the next generation of developers won't be stuck back at how do I store this information? How do I share it? Um, and the last sort of thing I want you to think of in the future, um, and you know, again, we're getting there today, is this idea of service registries, right? CAQH has already launched something which is very, very helpful, which is um, how do I find API providers? How do I find the access to the information that I want? What applications exist that will enable me to sort of take advantage of this? And that's just with today's announcements associated with the payer environment and what's coming there. You can imagine that as we go forward, like, look, all you have to do is look at the history of the internet. People came up with ways to find um, find the information they wanted, expose the information they wanted, and make it available. Especially given the the value chain that we're going to provide in healthcare, you know, you can imagine the reduced costs in some places, the administrative savings, the ability to take that and then drive research, which delivers new value. The idea of being able to create these registries is not just driven by um, the desire to do something fun and, the, and, and right, there is definitely commercial um, benefits as well as societal benefits driving this. And that's the magic, is this confluence of commercial and societal benefit that comes from this approach. And if you think about what that meant for the internet, you know, geeks like myself in the early 90s were playing with, with, with the internet and saying, oh, this is way better than what geeks like myself in the 80s were playing with um, to do BBSs. We're in that state now. You know, geeks like myself have been playing with health data exchange, um, and now we're starting to see commercial value. And I've managed to grow a pretty good business off the back of this um, with the collaboration of lots of visionary people. And I think uh, there's more to come. And and that's in my head the outcome we're looking for, right? This ability to have what we get with the internet today, to go to tomorrow's Google and say, I really need to understand what's driving events in this in this region with this condition and get back information that at least gives you a starting point to try and as a researcher or as a clinician um, evaluate what's going on with your patients, maybe even provide you back links to best practices, to care plans, to all those things that, that will augment your ability to deliver service. I think there's huge opportunity here and all we have to do is get past this barrier that we've talked about today, today like the siloization and this, this sort of repeated pain we keep providing ourselves. We have to push data and make it your, your problem to figure out how to use it. All right. 
so that that is is my is my sort of defense of the position that APIs and 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 the standards of practice that we have now are going to be driven by patterns which align with what the the internet did before. And so, what can the Internet of Health learn from the internet? Well, so open standards, right? We the, the most important thing is we don't want to be proprietary. If you can put your information into a format that everybody can use, then you can switch between vendors, you can switch between platforms, and you can get the best technologies. It opens up to innovation. The people who do it best will get the business and there'll be lots of imp there'll be lots of motivation for us as a, as a as a community to keep innovating, right? That's you know, it's being driven by the fact that you know you don't have I don't have you locked in. You're you're able to um, choose what's best for you, and of course, you know there is there is always going to be some pain of shifting between vendors or implementations. But the more open you are, the more um, the more you can accomplish. And if you look at that comment from Tim Berners Lee, Sir Tim Berners Lee, I have to say, uh, what he said was, you know, if it had been proprietary, if it had been his own personal standard, it would never have moved forward. And you can see that because there was another standard at the time that was really cool. It was called Gopher. And it was what we were using to share files before HTTP took off. But that one started to get licensed and it had a bunch of challenges that grew up around it. And the open standards are where things went. And so I think this is a thing that, that, that the Internet of Health can really benefit from is let's not try and lock each other into proprietary standards. Let's accept that the future really is um, driven by openness. And let's look at where we can deliver value and services as being where we can start to sort of differentiate ourselves, right? How I give you the right care pathways, how I provide you with the right AI engagement, how I deliver um, the best vision for your patients, for your practice, for your um, for, for your revenue cycle. Those are all things that are that are where we should be looking at, not how do I exchange the information and you know what what's what what, what information you're gonna tell me in this exchange. All of that should be transparent. So the, the idea that we can take from the internet is this notion of um, open standards and and um, shared implementation. I think the um, idea of, of, of well, I just kind of just kept on this. I'm going to jump over the slide in the interest of time. Um, and and we've got a lot of we've got a lot of sort of details here that I want you to read as as people who've got access to this deck, which we'll share afterwards. Um, so I'm going to talk about the future of the of, of, of fire because I think that is really important. Um, so, Fire itself is a standard that um, is available freely, that is published by HL7, that has a broad community participating in it, and it gives you a bunch of things. It's not just a data standard. It gives you an API that tells you how you can interact with information. It gives you it gives you operations that let you do cool things, and it lets you um, have a data model that uh, describes the structure of healthcare in ways that are meaningful. And I've, I've heard lots of debate in my life about the fact that an interoperability spec isn't the same as a data spec because it's just not flexible and fast enough. But the FHIR standard is. The FHIR standard gives you the ability to add extensions that map to your urgent needs while you make a case for those things being more public, right? So you can push them to the standards body to add them on. But more importantly, if it turns out it's never going to be part of the standards body, it's okay. The FHIR standard accommodates your changes to it and your extensions to it. And as we get more mature, we may find easier ways to do that or alternate ways to do that. But the point is, there is no lock-in with FHIR that says you must only be chained to what can change slowly. You are absolutely free to use this data model as the core of your infrastructure and then extend it as you need and add operations as you need and add capabilities as you need. It's very different from past understandings of standards. And you know, someone could then say, well, then how is it a standard? Well, because that 80%, which is actually shareable and consistent, remains consistent. The stuff that you want to be able to easily tell everybody, come and get my information in this way, remains there. And the cool part about the FHIR standard is if you send them your extensions and the additional pieces that they don't understand, they are obliged to ignore them and only operate on those pieces that are part of the standard that you've exposed. And so. Um, there is no corollary to past health standards that does it this way, right? This is why FHIR is such a novel and interesting way of tackling things. And then it comes alongside it with an approach for access that's really innovative as well. So the smart on FHIR approach really gives us a methodology 
for ensuring that we're mapping security appropriately to the access pathways. And it uses something uh, very interesting called uh, OpenID Connect, which is based on top of another standard called OAuth2. And OAuth2 and OpenID Connect give us a mechanism to bind the individual user to those things that they're entitled to access. And you know, within, within our platform, for example, you can um, say this is a member, and then that member can only see that member's data. So imagine in the case where that member was, um, as we were discussing earlier, compromised, what they could do is you know, grant an inappropriate use of their own information for that one time, but they were already doing that because their system was, was broken into. They aren't able to use that pathway to then expose other people's because they're not given um, anything but this sort of uh, abstract API as a pathway for access. And that abstract API is tested and retested and maintained at a security level that's appropriate for the internet. You know, it's appropriate for Google, it's appropriate for Apple, not at a level that's appropriate for your home PC. And that's really the critical path here. How am I doing for time? Um, I think I'm okay, all right. Um, so, implementation guides. I talked about these, and this is really important. Implementation guides tell you how to use Fire to achieve an outcome that has been decided by the community is valuable. Or you can tell the community how to use Fire to achieve an outcome that you think is valuable. This is really important when it comes to um, the success of, of a standard, right? So. An implementation guide tells you, here is how we are going to expose a capability. And the one we're going to look at in some depth is how do you enable prior authorization using the FHIR standard. But it could be, how do I enable HEDA scores? Or how do I enable you to find your patient in my environment? Or how do I enable you to advertise your um, roster to payers that are interested to find their members in your community, like on and on and on. There are an, any idea that we have in healthcare for a need, we can build an implementation guide, create a standard, and then tell everybody in the community, this is how to achieve this outcome in a way that is open, so you can create your own and share them, or managed through the HL7 community, so we have an official set of standards. Very, very powerful. The ability to describe yourself to others, what you can do in the same way that the community makes definitions for uh, real implementation. And the cool part about this is, all of us who are involved in tooling for the Internet of Health give you the ability to take your implementation guide and make it real in your infrastructure expose things the way that you want them exposed and be able to tell people that this data quality isn't up to your standard, this implementation, so when they integrate with you, they can ensure that their implementation maps to yours. And you've given them the rules, you've given them the ability to test it, you've given them all of the tools they need to be successful. And collectively, we've created all the tools we need to be successful for those big ones that we all agree we have to do. HEDIS, prior authorization, you know, and, and on from there. I think this is really helpful here. I think the idea that um, FHIR is a gateway to open standards, uh, which are anonymized and depersonalized, is really helpful for research. You know, um, the, the whole point is that now you as a data owner can say, I'd like to expose this information in formats that are used by the community. I'm gonna pick on OMOP because it's a really great standard and allows you to have um, you know, the, the ability to share clinical evidence in ways that others can use without risking uh, disclosure of personal health information in ways that jeopardizes your patients. Th th this opportunity we have through FHIR is standardized mappings between a well-established specification that is a fully identified flow and all of these open standards for health information that supports clinicians. And by providing these standardized mappings, we can either do that in real time or we can do it in the traditional format where I go and do queries. In fact, I can have a flow that's coming out of my fire right into your OMOP environment on an hourly, minute, on a moment by moment basis in ways that are going to provide additional value. And, and this um, approach really supports researchers because they, you know, they're, they're not always interested in legacy information. They may actually need real event driven activities. And more than that, they may have access to more information on the back of their patients. So they could find out that a particular um, source of information is available and then go and query further through the fire specification. This, this approach of being able to have a common mapping that's well established, that can be reused by others, that has, you know, as long as I've applied this implementation guide, 
I have this collection of data in my core store. Here's how I can share it with others in ways that are meaningful and useful for research. This is game changing, right? It, it, and if we do it right, if we if we do it in such a way that all the participants know how to do this together, they can all they can all benefit collectively from what previously would be considered competitive information and that ability to share information amongst clinicians in ways that is not um, going to diminish their ability to, um, to to benefit themselves while benefiting the community is game changing. I think, I think this is one of those features that in the long run, people try and imagine how we ever did it beforehand. The, the researchers, the ability for, you know, if you think about what this means, imagine a patient is able to self-identify for a participant in studies where researchers can then use um, a service that's made available by the by the stewards of those patients to be able to make it available. Imagine in the future where patients can self-identify to um, broader communities, you know, through trusted channels to say, I'm interested and have direct relationships with research communities. It's, it is, it is a broad broad spectrum that's available. There's a whole, there is a, there's a whole panorama that's coming that we just don't have to. And this is kind of the theme I'm trying to get to on my, why is the internet of health important? Is this idea that if you look to the future, once we break down the barriers for communication, once we're no longer doing BBSs for all of their great value, once we're saying this information, of, of course I can get to the data, of course I can find a patient, of course I can tell you what their conditions are, look at where we can get to. Think about what that means for research. I can get all the people with a particular condition. More importantly, I can find out what other meds they were on beforehand. I can filter for those people who are part of my interest of study and then they can I can find the ones that have self-identified back to me for participation I can they, there is just this this boundless sea of opportunity and 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 potentially ways to um, you know benefit society off of what has already been done in the research community there's just there is there's there is a open opportunity here so OMOP if you think about what this lets you do um, you can imagine there's a bunch of sources participating with a set of information in a clinical model where analysts, I'm going to leave this here for you guys. I mean, I don't need to explain this further. I just went on for a bit on, on the last slide. But this kind of shows the notion that you've got a common format and a common capability that common analytical tools can go against and then provide back, you know, for example, uh, clinical evidence to support a decision in question. Clinical quality language. This is one of my favorites. This is really, really neat. This was something that someone is one of our one of our team was able to do use to great benefit in a demo recently. Um, clinical quality language gives you a way to query the fire data in a in a repeatable fashion. So you can create a query that will work across multiple fire servers uh, once and then reuse it. And it was used by Ken Stevens, who's the head of our de backend development, um, to demonstrate something really, really neat. What he did was he took the well-established clinical quality language specification for a HEDIS query, um, applied it against a fire server, and then came back with a measure evaluation um, and the whole activity from cradle to grave, given the quality of the query that was given to him, took him two hours. You can imagine anybody who's got a data set going out and being able to, I mean, it's hard to imagine anybody having done that before. The ability to use something as, as innovative as a common query language that can go across multiple repositories, we've got standard backends, you can now try to imagine ways that people can say, here's a query that will get you this clinical um, event information and just apply it against your fire store fire server as long as you've got this implementation guide built, as long as you adhere to this particular pattern, this query will be part of the value prop that you get. And it means that you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, right? This is one of those things that's really hard to solve, is how do I interact with health data in a repeatable way? Well, guess what? Once we get the common standard, once we have the common profiles, once we've exposed those consistent APIs, now I can get benefit in terms of ways I query, in terms of ways I interact, in terms of way I expose the data for research. And, and this is the huge value. This is the forward thinking pieces that the internet is going to bring. And these are, you know, these are what I see today from my 1994 perspective. Imagine where we'll be a decade from now or two decades from now with our, our 2021 perspective or whatever, you know, it'll be 2041, but the perspective that we have today relative to the internet when we apply that relative to healthcare. And I've I put links in here for the CQL specification um, because I think it's very valuable. So you can see the specs um, I've talked about as, you, as we go. 
Um, I have to be careful because I have uh, only a short period of time left in a lot of slides. So um, I'm going to show you some common implementation guides. DaVinci has done a great job, and that's why I'm picking on them. Um, they have their uh, payer data exchange, which shows how to exchange information between payers so that health records can come with you. They have their prior authorization. So this was the one I was going to talk about. Um, if you look at this, this shows an implementation guide image, right? It shows here's how you use CDS hooks to do coverage requirements discovery. So to find out what it is that's covered. And then how do you use CQL to use document um, templates to find the document templates you have to fill out. And then finally, the prior authorization assertion, which uses existing technologies like X12 and fire interfaces to be able to go through that process where you actually decide, am I going to get information back? And when we talk about what this means, um, this process can take months today. We can get this down if we follow through this pattern that they've shown here to um, as fast as the payer is willing to use, and this is where the workflow piece comes in, a workflow on their end that allows them to apply their secret sauce to the authorization process. And you can imagine the benefit this gets. Suddenly the payer administrative costs go down so that they've got the opportunity to be more innovative in their offerings. The providers find out right away whether or not you're covered. So the patients get immediate decisions on healthcare and the patients get better care. The entire system from patient to provider to payer benefits and all of it on the back of improved efficiency and decision support tools that exist through the technology deployment of a well-established um, implementation guide, a thing that explains to all of us how we can have a level playing field. And we don't have to disclose our secret sauce because there are components within here to protect that in terms of workflow and implementation. I think this is really in my head the ground zero definition of why an open standard is so beneficial. The payers, the providers, the patients all coming together in one workflow, one efficiency, to achieve an outcome that delivers better value for all three. There is no loser here, there's only winners. And that is unheard of. That is a huge victory for all of us. I'm talking quickly here because I wanna move through. I would, have, I would have spent a bit more time dwelling on the specific flows, um, the CDS hooks implementation, the CQL questionnaire implementation, um, but I think I wanna get through the rest of the slides and leave some time for some questions at the end. Um, burden reduction, this sort of further discussion about how to use the various flows I just talked about to achieve the outcomes. You can read through this, I'll include it, in the, I'll leave the deck for everybody to be able to see. Um, Cost transparency, uh, I was gonna talk about this in some detail. If you think about price transparency, what this really calls on is the idea that you do an evaluation of somebody's condition, you do a clinical analysis, you need actually the clinical decision support to be there for you to say, ah, this is what this would cost under these circumstances. At the end of the day, um, the creation of the implementation guides, the use of the common standards, allows us to expose uh, price transparency in ways that are meaningful to patients and providers at the time they're making a decision. Um, the core implementation guide is essential for all of the features that we're talking about. This tells us how to define what a patient is, what a medication is, what a lab looks like, and on and on. It's a very rude set. It's, it's grown over time. It started off as the Argonaut set and um, has become enshri enshrined in the specifications going forward. Uh, again, this is all nascent, right? This is about this is about the vision that um, that the administrations have had around rolling out consistent strategies to healthcare. I think this is really, really useful um, alignment between government and, and, the, and, and the community to deliver value. And what we're gonna see going forward, of course, is further alignment between patients, providers, and practitioners, because this ground is so fertile for collaboration between all of them. Uh, Karen Blue Button, this is, this is an opportunity for providers. I wanna talk about this specifically. So one of the things that patients have um, the ability to do under the new uh, ONC rules, if they're, if they're covered by Medicaid or Medicare, um, is that they're entitled to get access to their health records that their payers have. And what this means for providers is there's now a channel for you to have an enriched data set across all of the healthcare providers that this patient has been to before, if that patient can give you access to their data. And amazingly enough, that patient can give you access to their data. So now as a provider community, you can use all of the 
all of the information that's being provided to patients to inform your data. And at least you're going to get out of this provenance that it came from a payer who's paid for this in the past for healthcare provision through another provider. So it's trustworthy information that's come on at the at the hands of a trustworthy partner that you're already working with as a you know a provider who's got this patient, presumably you're getting information from their payer, right? Um, the patient, the, the, the provider payer links are coming, but today your patient has this information available to them. If you think about an innovative use of technology where you're able to get your patient to um, consent to your access to this information, you can see this information yourselves and gain valuable insight into the care history of your patients as they go across the, um, the various sort of journey of, the, of, their, of, their, of their patient experience. This is game changing, I think. I don't think there is any current way for this patient mediated data to get to your doorstep as effectively and comprehensively as this. And why? Because the coming step of the of the ONC regulations is that as your patient moves across plans and providers, their history has to be able to follow them. The providers have to send the patient records that had previously been acquired through prior payers to their new payer to make it available for the patient to have in their new electronic health record. Can you imagine a common standard exposed through an implementation guide defined by Karen for you to get the history of your patient's interactions regardless of which health system they were part of in their past. This may not be, you know, critical for simple things like, you know, blood test results which have timely outcomes, but you can well imagine earlier diagnoses or uh, procedures that have been implied. This is great information that you might not have or, you know, um, medication histories that, that have had um, clinical efficacy because you might be able to see that they got better when they had some medication they've stopped taking because their plan didn't allow it. You know, on and on and on. There's just a wealth of information that you as a provider can gain from this interaction. And it's all available to you today, right? We're in the pro final stages. Compliance is mandatory for this health record by July 1st. That's when when the ONC has started to said that, you know, they've, they've given people, it was supposed to be implemented by January 1st. The plans were a little bit slow off the mark, but they're getting there. All of this data will be available to you as clinicians in the hands of your patient, patient-mediated access to health records. This, I think, is a game changer. It's new and it's going to deliver huge value. And I have to say that the decision to do this was prescient. The people who thought about this and came to the table this idea, realizing that the payers were the ones who were going to be um, delivering the value, really got a good idea and they, they delivered it well. The other cool thing, which I think is important for payers here, is to realize that now you're part of the care team. You've got this health data. You understand your, your members well enough. You know, my dad worked in insurance. He was an automotive insurance. And what he said to me once, and I think this applies to all insurers, I think it should apply to all of us. He said, you know, as an insurer, I would much rather make the highways safer. So I'm not arguing with people about whether or not their injury from a collision or their injury from an accident um, should be covered, that they're always safe and, and that I'm paying money into what he called the Sunshine Safety Club. I think we should all join the Sunshine Safety Club. This idea that payers, providers, and patients work together to prevent illness, to use the information we have at hand to protect ourselves, that's, that's really the magic that's coming from this. And I think that was the prescient view that these guys had. Um, I really am pushing up against my time here. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk through these slides and let you know what's here so you can review them yourselves on coming days. So we talk a little bit more about the consequence. We talk about the challenges, and I think this one is really an easy one to suss out yourself. The complexity of the existing information is the Achilles heel of interoperability. How do I get data out of its existing environment into the fire spec and make that available has been our challenge. Well, we're all building tools that do this. We've got great people in this environment who are using NLP, um, companies that are using existing mapping tools. And, and the mi migration of information into fire is going to be that great transition. Once it's into fire, it's structured and it's in formats that we can then repurpose and reuse going forward. But this is the thing that we're all having to overcome. It's a big challenge now and it's where we're going in the future. Um, 
and so you know, I talk a little bit about addressing the complexity of it here. Um, talk about showing how mapping works. Uh, this line here about opening up to train AIs and other knowledge-based frameworks to provide responses without disclosing information, it's a little bit misstated. What this should say is this allows us to use AIs to do the transformation. That transformation, that engagement with AI infrastructure allows us to enable future AI capabilities. And there's some really cool things such as uh, the ability to disclose information to AI training environments without disclosing either the, the, the algorithm the AI is using or the data that the AI source either participants. But it's a little bit misplaced here, but it's, it's still the, the point is valid. So when you read it, understand that. Um, privacy and security. I, I talked about this earlier on. This is absolutely top of mind for all of us who've been in healthcare. As somebody who's been in healthcare for 20 years and specifically um, population health, we have been focused from day one in security. And so this overlay applies to everything we do. It's enshrined in legislation. It's in, in, it's enshrined in HIPAA. It's enshrined in GDPR. In Canada, we have a variety of legislations led by PHIPAA. Um, in, in Australia, there's a Privacy Act. Everywhere you go, health information is treated as highly sensitive, if not secret. And so consequently, all these infrastructure providers build out their tooling to protect you. This is one of the benefits you get of this move to fire is you're operating on the back of a community that views this information as sacrosanct and is fully aware of their obligations to protect it and the consequences of not protecting it. If there's a disclosure of health information, that is a that is an existential threat to one of the providers of these health services. They are so focused on protecting themselves that they will shut down their operations before they'll shut down disclosure of data. And so you've got that ability to force the provider community to live up to your expectations, but they're already holding themselves accountable right from the start. And so there's a new standard coming, by the way, this is really cool, UMA, uh, user managed access allows users to determine who has access to their information. So not only do you have this position where you're able to pr have strong protections, but now the users participate in it. So you can say things, and this is really, really neat. I will give these organizations permission to see this kind of information about me, but nothing else. And so the really, the really obvious use case for UMA is outside of healthcare, but it's if I go to a bar, I don't have to show my driver's license anymore to prove my age. I can have an application that exposes that just says, from that driver's license, we can tell you this person's over, over 19 or over 21 or over whatever the drinking age is where you happen to be. You don't have to show a bouncer where you live anymore to get access to you know what would otherwise be desirable for a young person. And, and that pattern is especially important in healthcare. This person has been immunized. Not this person, here's their health history, go and figure out their immunization. An easy strategy says, I will share with anybody my immunization status and then services using the implementation guides to go and discover immunization status and expose it in ways that have really trusted backing behind it. You can imagine that, you know, FIRE has this co concept of um, attribution and, and, and so provenance is what it's called as, as, a, as a resource. It'll get you where you want to get to. I, I'm really running against my time here. So um, I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly. Um, so versioning is important, the ability to stay relevant. Fire has that baked in. Um, and the, like I'd like to say, the last piece I want to talk about before I get to the end is our challenge amongst the people in the fire community is not each other. I view everybody who's going after an open standard strategy as our colleague and our peer, regardless of whether they're competitors for any given business um, outcome we're going to. We are going up against a very big challenge, which is the status quo. We are the ISPs of 1994, and the future is filled with the internet, but together we have to get there. And so to all of my colleagues, and all of my peers in this space, you know, we all work together. We've got a group called Fireball um, who are who are promoting the value of fire to everybody. And, and in there are people who have the same sort of products, who are competing for the same sorts of clients, but we all see each other as collaborators and trying to deliver value. And I think that is really going to make a big difference in the long run. Um, we've included some case studies, Apple Health Integration. They were brilliantly foresightful, um, insightful in their approach. They, they use Smart on Fire as their mechanism. Their phones store information safely. They make it available to you and they're able to interact with all of your partners. Very, very excellent use of the Fire standard. Um, you know, and, and talk a little bit about the integration. Um, th there's health research exchanges who do really interesting stuff as well. HSSC uh, in South Carolina done fantastic work um, and kind of, you know, kind of show you the challenge for, for researchers that we were talking about earlier on. Um, and so I'm going to leave it there because we've run out of time. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take questions um, and, and continue on. Um, you can reach me at my, my office address, duncan at smilecdr.com.